so listen, we have a, a bit of an unusual situation here. Um, I'm actually presenting only the audio part of this program because I cannot get the video to work and my other presenter and co-host Peter Benet has some noise issues or else he'd be the one presenting. He does a really awesome job, but unfortunately you won't be able to hear him do the background noise. So I'm hoping that together we can get this to work. We'll have to see, but uh, I am hopeful that this is going to still be a good presentation. So anyone, thank you so much for joining us today for our presentation, our webinar on Are You a Financial Disruptor? Learn how to protect your FinTech idea. Okay, going on to the next slide. All right, this is about me. Uh, well, actually, I'm half the, of the duel right now presenting. I'm the one talking, Devorah Grazer. I'm the founder and CEO of KISS Patent. I'm a US patent agent. I have 21 years of patent experience, including four years programming with the Human Genome Project. I was the former vice president of intellectual property at CompuGen. Now, CompuGen was a startup at that time, uh, growing rapidly. And like all startups, it had the problem of wanting to protect its ideas, but at the same time, having budget and other constraints. These are simply startup realities. And so I learned really how it looks from both sides of the table and how to balance the needs of the startup and of course of its patent portfolio in order to be certain that the startup has the best future based on its ideas. So the disclaimer, this is what happens when you spend too much time hanging out with lawyers. Nothing in this presentation or in any material provided, whether verbally or in writing, constitutes legal or patent advice. So can you protect your fintech idea? Well, let's dive right in. Fintech is evolving fast. So let's first of all take a look at where the industry has been and where it's going, because that will have a big influence on whether or not you can protect your particular fintech idea. So it's evolving fast. 1998, PayPal was founded. 2006, Lending Club was founded. Of course, they're a bit infamous for uh, some of their behavior around their loans, but uh, still overall a successful startup. In 2009, Satoshi Nakamoto, a person or a group of people we still don't know, released Bitcoin. And in 2012, Oscar was founded. Now, Oscar is a very important platform for insurance. We're going to be getting into insurance as an example of one of the major ways in which fintech is changing. Oscar's not that well known outside the US and even within the US, they're mainly operating on the East Coast, although they also operate in a few other states. But Oscar is showing what digital um, disruption can do to all kinds of businesses which have a strong financial component. FinTech is also filing for patents quickly as an industry. Now there are multiple aspects of that industry. Many fintech innovators have filed for patents. So PayPal, Oscar, Kensho, once described as the Siri for Wall Street, have all filed for numerous patents. But big banks are also piling into patents. Bank of America, BBVA, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, etc., all are filing tons and tons of patents. So now it's a race between the innovators and the big uh, fintech companies, particularly the big banks. They're, I think, the biggest patent filers of the traditional financially oriented companies, but everyone is filing as quickly as they can. So continuing on specifically to what big companies are filing, like I said, um, these include now the big banks, of which I give two examples, Goldman Sachs with over 600 patents, JP Morgan with over 1,000 patents, and PayPal has over 900 patents. So this is a lot of patents. And these are all quite big companies, but they are filing at an increasingly rapid rate. And a big part of why they're filing at such a rapid rate is because of the competition. So did you know over 100,000 published US patent applications are related to FinTech? Now, of course, this is <clears throat> since I believe 2001. So there's a lot of these applications, <coughs> excuse me, that have been published over quite a few years. Uh, FinTech applications aren't just software, they're of course also platforms and systems, but you might be kind of surprised to learn there's quite a few hardware patents in this area as well. We'll get into that 
why and what's going on with that in a moment. Nearly 9,000 patent applications were published in the US in 2017 to date. We haven't even finished the year yet. So this is a significant increase over those US patent applications that were published in 2016. What this means is that the space is heating up and every year more and more FinTech patent applications are publishing. What does it mean for you and your startup? Well, you shouldn't file too late. If you have a FinTech idea, you need to file fast because otherwise someone else could file before you. Now, why is this such an important point? Oh, can you please go back, Peter? Sorry. For those coming in late, um, Peter and I are doing this as a dual presentation. Uh, I unfortunately do not have a terribly good internet connection, so I am connecting all that audio. And Peter Benet, my awesome co-host, who always does a great job with these, unfortunately is in a very noisy area, so you wouldn't be able to hear him if you were to present, so we're doing this as a dual job. So what exactly is the problem with filing too late. In the US, as in every other country, the most important point about patents, if you have to remember just one point from this webinar, is that first to file wins. This means the longer you delay, the more likely it is that someone else will file before you. Now, it doesn't matter if they file a day before you. It doesn't matter if they file a few weeks before you. It doesn't even matter if you were working on your idea for several months, and someone else only works on it for a few days, a week, two weeks, doesn't matter. If someone files before you, then they win because it's a first to file system. There's no other way around it. The US did used to have a different system, this is true. Many people still remember that older system, but that older system is no longer there. Only the new system exists in every single country in the world, and what this new system means is that whoever files first wins. Now, because so many ideas are coming onto the market at the same time, often with a rush. Remember I mentioned Oscar to you before, that insurance FinTech startup. Well, right now, insurance startups are the hot thing. They're what everyone wants to be or what everyone wants to fund in the FinTech space. Oscar filed for some patents but other startups that come later may have a hard time filing or may have a hard time differentiating themselves in the space. They may also have a hard time defending their market niche because they're coming into the space later. And this means they're gonna be filing later. So if you're already in this space, in the FinTech space, and particularly in hot parts of the FinTech space, like for example, insurance, you want to be certain that you're not filing too late. You want to get your patent started now so that you file so that you win that first to file battle. All right, let's go on to the next slide and the kind of ideas that you can protect. So what kinds of FinTech ideas can you protect? Now this is mainly US oriented. Uh, the US has the broadest provisions for software patents of any country in the world. For that reason, uh, I'm focusing on the US because you can get the best and broadest software patents, including for FinTech, as of any other country. Some of these things here, particularly um, the hardware and some of the platforms could also be patentable in other countries, but they might not be. So again, this is just for the US. So in the US, if you wanna protect your FinTech ideas, some examples include platforms. Now these of course include payment and transaction platforms, so Stripe and PayPal. You can also, however, protect platforms relating to compliance. This is a hot new area. It can be financial compliance. It could be compliance with different types of regulations. Any kind of compliance, this is also a really important area that is starting to be automated. For example, for banks, you have this requirement known as KYC. Uh, no, it's not a variation on Kentucky Fried Chicken. KYC means know your customer. Banks are required to know their customers. Who are their customers? What kind of transactions are they making? Do they know who they're sending money to? Is there any possibility of money laundering or money being sent to unsavory characters or criminals or countries where such transfers have been outlawed? The US is particularly strict about this. So compliance is a big FinTech issue. And the banks, of course, do employ automation in their own compliance, but compliance is a far reaching problem. For example, there's export compliance, which means you have to obey many rules before exporting, not just physical goods, but also knowledge outside the United States. 
Another example of an important type of platform has to do with regulatory. So there are platforms which assist uh, customers in all kinds of regulations. For example, there's strong regulations in health, again, in banking and finance, there obviously are strong regulations. But basically in any industry where there's a strong set of rules and regulations, where there's a very strict regulatory regime, platforms there that can automate this and can uh, may take the risk out and can make it work better are potential things that can be protected. Financial products such as insurance. Insurance is very hot, like I said before, and of course, general banking. Within software, um, in addition to some of the platforms, there are also specific softwares which are more standalone, for example, for trading or for risk management. And in hardware, uh, one example I found is a cooling system for financial information storage. Because financial information is so sensitive and has such strong requirements for uptime, there's actually a patent which specifically talks about a cooling system for hardware to make it have much higher uptime and be much more reliable. So these are all examples of fintech ideas that can be protected with patents. I'll go, yep, there we go. So patents are the broadest protection for your ID. Um, just to give you some examples, idea protection relates to the protection of intangible property. This is property you can't put your hand on. So for example, cars and houses are tangible property and you can protect them by putting them in a garage for a car or putting a lock on your door for a house or putting up a fence or whatever it is you'd want to do. Intangible property is only valuable if it's shared. So for example, your car retains value and probably retains more value if you don't share it. <laughs> But uh, for ideas, that's not the case. You have to share them. There are different kinds of ways you can share your ideas. Uh, patents are the broadest way you can do that. They provide the broadest protection. And why is this? Because patents protect the core of your idea. Patents are the only form of idea protection that allows you to protect the core of your idea, the concept, the general idea, or the surrounding aspects of the idea. Using patents, you can block competitors from entering your space. So in other words, only with patents, you can protect a market niche. Finally, patents are the best defense against copycats because they are so broad. This breadth means that those who want to take your idea and maybe change a little bit of it and then use it as their own could be blocked if you file for a patent. Of course, you have to file for it early enough that you're first to file. You have to write the patent well. You have to make certain all your ideas are in there and are well explained. We'll get to that later on. But a well-written patent, which is filed early enough, is the best defense against copycats. You can use that to keep copycats from taking your ideas and using them as their own. So the next slide answers the question of what is patentable? Well, patentable ideas are those which fall into First of all, patentable categories. The first test of any idea to see if you can get a patent for it is to see if it falls into a category of patentable ideas. And these generally relate to technology. So for example, software, hardware, high tech. Uh, those are the examples we're mainly gonna be talking about today. Those are all examples of technology. Other examples of technology include mechanical devices, chemicals, drugs, et cetera. But the technology is broadly enough defined as shown by that quote uh, from a Supreme Court case saying that what is patentable in terms of what falls into a patentable category, anything under the sun made by the hand of man or woman, that was actually from a Supreme Court case indicating that genetically modified bacteria were actually patentable. And it really extended the boundaries of what would be considered patentable and what you could get patents for, which previously were not nearly as broad. And it really started off the history then of having patents get broader and broader in the US, particularly for software. So what is not patentable? If all these things are patentable, it sounds like everything's patentable, right? Well, no, that is not the case. Different types of ideas have different types of idea protection. And some ideas can't be protected by patents. So one example of a type of idea that can't be protected by patents is content. Content like music or images, books, video. Those types of ideas which are all content related are protectable by copyright. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, one of the things that's kind of confusing about copyright is that computer software code 
is also protectable by copyright, but copyright is a very narrow right. It only protects direct copying. So for example, if someone directly copies your code, then you have a copyright case. Someone doesn't directly copy your code, if they just copy the idea behind the code and then they reprogram it themselves, then you can't defend yourself with uh, copyright, you have to defend yourself with a patent. And of course, content in general, like those types I listed there, are only protectable with copyright. And what about things like names, logos, slogans, Coke, Coca-Cola, the famous Coke logo, Coke the real thing, one of the famous Coke slogans. These are all trademarks or marks under which trade is conducted. And they are not protectable by patent. They are only protectable by trademark protection. Uh, trademark protection, again, is a much more narrow type of protection. It is only focused on the specific thing uh, that is being protected plus anything which is highly similar. But again, you can't protect your awesome FinTech idea with a trademark. Protect your great FinTech name with a trademark though. Like if you wanted to have a fin, uh, fintech name like PayPal, if it wasn't already taken, you could protect that with the trademark, and they definitely did. So let's continue on to the summary slide. By the way, if you dump in the uh, uh, request into the chat, and I think Peter is monitoring the chat. Yes, oh, that's right, Peter, thanks so much. I'm so glad you're monitoring that. If you put in a request into the chat, just put in your email address. Uh, we will send you the slides after this talk. And then you can study the slide more at your leisure. So there's a lot of information on this uh, slide, but what it's talking about generally is the summary of what is a patent and why do you need it. So here on the left, starting with what is a patent, it's a form of idea protection. As noted on the slide, you can block others and others can block you, right? So patents are a right to block. Uh, just because you have a patent doesn't mean that you necessarily have the right to make users sell your idea, but if you have a patent, you have a form of defense. You can exchange, for example, licenses or agreements with others who have patents if they accuse you of patent infringement, and then everyone basically walks away friends. So patents are for defense, but they're also for litigation and, and offense, meaning if someone else takes your idea, you can go to court and defend it. Uh, patents are viable business assets and investments. This is because patents typically increase the valuation of a startup in the US by $1 million. And it can just be a patent application. It can just be provisional. You don't even have to say I have to have a patent. I've seen startups get bought you know, for tens of millions, if not more, dollars, very early stage startups. Like you're talking about very, very young startups. And a big chunk of what went into their valuation is the fact that already filed for patent applications. And bigger companies were afraid that if another big company bought this particular startup, because it's still quite young, then the other big company would have the patent applications, which would then turn to patents. And then the company that bought the startup were afraid that these other companies might attack it. So fear of missing out or FOMO is a super important point for patents as an asset, particularly when you're being considered for an acquisition. So company A could buy the startup in order to avoid having company B get the startup's patents, even if these are only patent applications and no one knows exactly what kind of protection you get. I've seen that happen lots of times, uh, both for companies in the news, but also for my clients. Now you can patent your idea in different categories and different types of patents. Um, mainly what we're talking about here is what's known as the utility patent. Uh, that's the regular kind of patent, but you can also file a provisional in order to get your foot in the door. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So how do you patent your idea? We're going to talk in a moment. They have to file a uh, patent application that includes uh, text and drawings. The most important point of this is to highlight the wow factor and the uniqueness of your idea. If you cannot emphasize why your idea is really unique and really has a big inventive innovative wow, then you are not going to get your patent. So you file, it's examined, and we'll talk about the process. It takes a bit of time to say the least. So how do you know if your idea is patentable? Well, it has to be in a patentable category, like I mentioned before. It has to be novel or non-obvious. I mean, it has to be inventive. And of course, you have to be the first one to file for that idea. Uh, by the way, if anyone has any questions about these, I would invite you to put your email address into the chat. Um, I can then send you an email. We can set up a time for a call. This is a lot of information. We're kind of going through it quickly because 
of course, not only will I send you these slides, but also we can have a talk about it later offline. Okay, now we're going to go on to the next slide. So you can get a pattern in four simple steps. The first step is you want to do a search to see if you're first. I actually recommend doing a Google patent search. You can literally Google Google patent search and you'll see this really nice uh, search engine that's just for patents. They also have a different one, their advanced Google patent search, which also includes what is known as non-patent literature, which are scientific articles. But the regular one works great for patents and patent applications all over, from all over the world, US, China, um, Canada, Australia, many, many countries. And it works just like regular Google. You put in some keywords and you see what's going on. What other things have people patented? Now, one important point to note with the search is that the patent applications that you see as published are only published 18 months after the first filing date. So you don't really know what's going on. Of course, no one will also know when you file for yours for 18 months that you've actually filed for because it won't publish for at least 18 months. So as a result, there's like an 18 month black hole that no one really knows what anyone else is up to. And this is particularly important in hot, fast moving areas like FinTech because in these hot, fast moving areas, what happens is that many people may end up filing for the same or similar ideas, not because they're copying each other, they're stealing each other's you know, secret ideas that haven't published yet. Uh, it's actually more just because when a certain industry reaches a certain stage, a certain amount of innovation has already gone in, uh, frequently great minds think alike. There can be multiple centers thinking of the same innovation at the same time. As an example, way back when, calculus, multiple people invented it at the same time, didn't steal each other's ideas, it was just in the air. So that's another thing to note, when you're doing a search, you're not gonna see what happened 18 months ago, they're not gonna see yours, that's another reason why I have to file fast. Okay, so decide you're gonna file. You've done your search, it looks great. You have to prepare your drawings and text. I'll give you an example of a patent drawing later on. They are really easy to do. Uh, in software, they're boxes and lines, in hardware, Depending on the hardware, you of course want to have like an electronic diagram, more boxes and lines. Um, the design of the physical aspects of the hardware may also be important, particularly if there are mechanical aspects to it as well. But really, these are not hard drawings to do. You then file your application and the examiner checks it. Now, this sounds great, right? This means that if once you file, you're going to get your patent really quickly. Well, the next slide shows. Unfortunately, it's that last step that really takes the longest time. So the first three steps can go super fast. You can do your own search, you can pay for a search, it does not have to take that long. <coughs> Excuse me. You then prepare drawings and text, that can take two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, not a ton of time. Uh, after that, you file your patent application, and I say a day, but it's literally an you know, hour, half an hour, because at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, um, you can file electronically. In fact, most countries these days offer electronic filing. You upload it, assuming it works, with which our friends at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is not always the case, but when it works, it works real fast. However, then it can take one to five years or more for the examiner to actually check the patent application. In hot areas like FinTech, uh, my experience recently has been, say, like two and a half to four years from the filing date before you get your first office action. It can take a little bit less, it can take a little bit more, but somewhere in that ballpark range. Within particular areas of FinTech, there seems to be actually more of a backlog just because they don't have enough examiners who are trained, but Overall, one to five years, it's checked, and then after that, uh, once you've finished doing a negotiation with the examiner over exactly how broad, how big your patent will be, then after that, the patent issues. Now, this is actually not bad for startups, and the reason why is because when a patent application has been filed, but before it's examined, it represents potential. You can put in as broad a claims as you feel you have a reasonable chance of getting, which is really awesome, and no one really knows actually what you're gonna get. So it's like the startup in that respect. Uh, no one actually knows um, how quickly you're going to succeed, how fast you'll grow, how big the startup will become, how much you'll be able to nail the uh, uh, competitors. And the same thing is true with your patent application. No one knows, you're gonna get broad claims, narrow claims, who knows? So while the patent application is pending, but before it's actually been examined, it represents potential and you can argue for the reasonableness of very, very broad claims. 
And I actually have seen this be a very important factor in investments. So I've seen some very sad posts someplace like Quora, where a startup founder says, coming online says, um, you know, we just almost had an investment, like I'm a SaaS company or whatever type of software typically, uh, in an area which is very hot and the investors are talking to us and they're really excited until suddenly the patent application of one of our competitors published and then the investors weren't so excited anymore. This is a major bummer, but it does happen because investors are spooked. They don't know if you're actually going to be able to make, use, and sell your idea if your competitor has a pu published patent application, you haven't filed for anything. Well, you have no way to defend yourself if you get attacked. So and that makes investors nervous. Uh, I also know that there are some startups that use patent applications as a form of psychological warfare. And one of the reasons I know this is in very hot areas in FinTech, what will happen is these startups, every time they file for a patent application, they'll put a notice on their website saying, hey, we just filed, and they'll give a really broad description of what the patent includes. And then various investors or partners of my clients will get very nervous, and they'll come talk to my clients, and then my clients come and talk to me and say, hey, what's going on? Is it really so broad, et cetera? And this has happened multiple times in a few different areas. So having a patent application filed, being patent pending, but for examination is great. This one to five year period is really good for you as the startup founder. So let's go on to the next slide, which asks the very important question, why file your patent? Like, why should you bother? Well, patents give you control. You can decide how others can use your idea. Here's an example. Let's suppose that you don't mind if not-for-profit organizations use your idea for free or at a very reduced rate, but you don't want commercial companies to use it for free or at a reduced rate. Patents enable you to have that degree of control. You can say who uses your idea and how they use it. You can also block others from patenting your idea. This is a super important point. If you're working in, on your idea in super stealth mode for a really long period of time and someone leaps in and files for the same idea before you, you are stuck, as I said before. So filing means at least other people can't patent your idea. You can also keep big companies from stealing your idea. Um, Steve Jobs was famous for describing how Apple would always borrow or copy or whatever, uh, steal, however you want to call it. Big companies will uh, take ideas if they think they can. Um, sometimes also they will have been working on something in parallels. Well, like I said, it may not actually be a direct theft. Some companies like Microsoft are known for direct thefts. Now they'll go and they'll talk to a startup and then later on, uh, suddenly Microsoft is using the idea. And this has happened a few times and in cases where the startup had patents, like for XML, uh, where Microsoft took that idea, the startup was able to defend itself because it had a patent covering the conversion of a document to XML and vice versa. And Microsoft had to pay them uh, damages and royalties, et cetera. So some companies will steal and sometimes it's simply independent invention, but either way, if a big company has your idea in its hands or a, has developed a similar idea, they could easily swamp you. You want to be able to protect yourself from that. So what, sorry, this should say FinTech. Uh, Rujel is gonna talk more about blockchain, but this is actually, of course, the FinTech webinar. So what FinTech idea do you want to patent? Well, the idea that is your heart of your business, the part of your business you could not live without. The part of your business that if it was taken, your business would be destroyed, it would fall down, it would collapse, it would be ruined. And this slide emphasizes it is the beating heart of your business. Think about that part of your business which is most important that you can't afford to lose. What do you want to patent? Well, also you want to patent anything the user experiences. As the well-known saying goes, users uh, want to buy a solution, they don't want to buy a technology. So for example, users want holes, they don't want drills. Why do they buy a drill? They buy a drill to make the hole. They don't buy a drill because they want a drill. They buy a drill because their end goal is to have that hole in their wall, for example. Users are buying your solution as a solution because they have a problem and you have the solution and that's the only reason why they're gonna buy your user product. So from the user's perspective, what's important is what the user experiences. Now, 
they don't really care about your wow backend idea, except to the extent that it gives them a seamless user experience and a great user solution. So you want to protect those aspects of your idea, which the user directly experiences. Now, I'm not saying you should file a patent exactly on wireframes, although, of course, you can include that in your patent application as an illustration. I'm talking about it more conceptually. Remember, patents protect concepts. So on a conceptual basis, you can use patents to protect those parts of your solution which are most important to the user and which are the reason why the user is paying for your solution in the first place. So remember, anything the user experiences should be protected to the extent you can. So what happens if you wait to file? Well, as this slide shows you, you can end up with the road closed and a big barrier and an inability to go forward. Someone else could file first and block you. I cannot emphasize this enough. One example is with the company now known as Snap, formerly known as Snapchat. They have a button on their app. Uh, the camera button, if you hold the camera down, it button down, it toggles from still images to video. They actually got a patent for that. And they had a competitor who filed for a patent for the same idea. Again, no theft involved, just great minds think alike. Both of them thought of it independently. And there was a 19 day filing difference between them. Now in this case, Snap came out on top, but wouldn't just Snapchat have been on the wrong end of that filing difference? They would have had a big, they would have had a big problem. So you don't want to be on the wrong end of a uh, filing divide of even a few days. And like I said, snap, 19 days, not a whole lot of time. The more you delay, the more likely you are that someone else will file before you. So how do you file fast? You're saying, well, this is going to be really complicated and I have to do a lot of stuff to get it ready and I need a lot of information and, and I've seen these US patents and they look real hard. I, I don't know about this. Well, that's why we recommend filing a U.S. provisional. The U.S. provisional application allows you to file fast and also file quite inexpensively with one of our awesome KISS patent packages, which you're going to get a special discount on, which I'll tell you about later. So a U.S. provisional application has the fewest regulations or rules. It's only available in the U.S. and it allows you to file really quickly because it has so few regulations and rules. You can change your patent within a year. So let's say you file your provisional. Within one year, you do have to continue the process. So let's say you file today. Within one year, you want to file in the US, but you have some new stuff, some new parts of your ideas, some new parts of your invention. You want to stick them in. Go right ahead. Anything that is new, completely new, will get a new filing date. But of course, what we always want to do is try to tie that to the old material as much as possible in order to argue as much as possible that the new material also should enjoy the old filing date. It has far fewer requirements. I cannot emphasize this point enough. It makes it much, much easier to file. Basically, if you can whiteboard your idea, you can file for a provision. Uh, it's cheap, but it gives you full coverage. By full coverage, it gives you for that year the right to file your application anywhere in the world and retain that date. So it's kind of a first to file protection. It gives you that date saying you were first to file on that date. Within one year, you can then decide to continue only in the US, or you can decide you want to continue internationally. Now, if you decide you want to continue internationally, you have another option called the PCT, or Patent Cooperation Treaty application. This international application gives you another year and a half after the end of that provisional year to decide what countries you want to file in. So you'll have two and a half years before you have to go through that major cost of filing in a lot of different countries. You want to do that, don't think you'll have the money, that's fine, you can just file in the US, but you have to do something at the end of a year. And the provisional gives you that year the same as a regular full application would, with the same rights in all the same countries all over the world. Now, I know that people have said that patents are complicated, and that people have asked me, how can I do it? And they, they say it's all very hard. Well, this is an example of a patent drawing. This is actually from Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg is one of the inventors on this patent. It is for their new newsfeed idea when it was new. And as you can see, it's a system which has a bunch of numbers and boxes and lines. So you have a bunch of user devices, which could be, for example, computers and mobile phones. They're connected to a computer network, which could be the internet. Uh, computer networks are always shown as fluffy clouds in patents. It's not actually a rule, but it might as well be because everyone always does it. 
and then also connected to that network, which allows the user devices to get their news feed, uh, is a social network provider, which has a mini feed engine. So then the social network provider in this case is, for example, the server for the provider, and the feed engine is an engine running in that server. This is the whole drawing. It's not complicated. It's really easy to do. Software boxes and lines. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. And even for hardware, electronic diagrams, electrical circuits, they don't have to be complicated either. They can be quite simple. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, you have some mechanical aspects. You might need to show those separately. But again, they don't have to be, be super complicated. <coughs> Now, some people ask me, for example, uh, when can I be ready to file? I mean, you look at the state of these drawings, it, as you can see, you don't have to actually build your idea in order to develop these drawings. This is true for hardware and mechanical devices as well, by the way. Hardware, electronic, software, mechanical devices. You don't, just looking at this drawing, what it tells you is that you don't need to have actually built your idea. You don't even have to have an MVP, minimum viable product. You don't need to have done any testing. All you need is a really good design. This is basically a design of a news feed, uh, the engine and how it interacts with these devices. This is not obviously the software itself, but you can't stick that in a computer and have it run. So all you need is a good design of your idea, and then you too can file for a provisional application in order to get that one year uh, period during which you can decide how you want to proceed. So really, you don't need to have built it. Again, I, I can't emphasize this point also. As I said before, if the one thing I want you to remember from this whole webinar is you must file first. And in order to make certain you're going to file first, you have to file fast. And in order to file fast, you may not want to wait until you've actually built your idea. A lot of times I talk to people and I'll give them the advice they should actually file as soon as they have a design. And the provisional application and these drawings, which are not hard to do, allow you to do just that. File quickly with just a good design. Okay, so now we go on to the next slide, which asks the question, can you do this yourself? Well, you could, but you need to know the following. Like startups, patents can be very complicated. So startups themselves are complicated. You have to have a complex uh, vision. You have to have a strategy. And you have to have a strategy for your patents, the same as you have a strategy for your startup. Now, your startup patent strategy should also mirror your startup strategy. If your uh, startup does not have a strategy, well, then it's going to be really hard to, for me or anyone else to give you advice on what patent to file. So you need to have a strategy for your patents that matches that for your startup, including with regard to your business model and how you're going to sell, what countries you're going to sell, etc. Now, just be confident you're making the right choice. It is really easy to decide by not deciding. So let's say you feel, oh, it's so complicated to do a patent, so you want to wait. Well, by waiting too long, you could actually be making the decision unwittingly, you know, by mistake, that you can't file at all. What is the example? One super important uh, example for this is what um, would happen if you publish your idea. Let's say you decide to put it out there, you uh, release it freely from your website, you allow people to access it freely without an invitation, without any kind of password or NDA, and you want to get a good, you want to see if you can get a reaction from people. That's great. Once you publish, you can only file in the U.S. because uh, only the U.S. has a grace period after you publish your idea. Other countries, you have to file before you publish. And yes, patents are per country rights. If you want protection in the U.S., you have to file in the U.S. If you want protection in China, you have to file in China. So you decide however you want to publish your idea anyway. You, don't, you only want to file in the U.S. Fantastic. Uh, but then you don't keep track of that one-year deadline. And more than a year passes before before you even think about filing your U.S. provisional application or any type of U.S. patent application, well, then it is too late. If more than a year passes after you publish your idea, then you will not be able to file for a patent. Even in the U.S., it'll be too late. So don't make um, a mistake and make a stealth decision uh, not to file by simply not keeping track of the deadlines or by not actively making the right choice. So how can we help? Well, we have fixed price packages which are tailored to your needs and we give full support for startups. What does this mean? We do not work on hourly based fees. Other patent attorneys and agents, they work on hourly based fees. You have no idea how much your provisional or other patent's gonna cost. The 
project could have a budget that balloons out of control. However, we work on fixed price packages. So you only pay for what you need and you know how much it's gonna cost in advance. We have different packages which are tailored to your needs, the needs of different startups. So you have full control over what you get. Don't pay for services you don't need. We also have a lot of experience with software companies and startups and also hardware companies in the FinTech space. We give you full support to protect your idea. Our basic patent package is $2,500 and it covers the US provisional process for you. And we'll also give you a 10% discount if you order it with our Webinar 10 promo code. Now, normally the webinar would end here, and this would be the promo code you'd get, Webinar 10, and you'd get 10% off. But just for you guys, because I think FinTech is really awesome, and I want to uh, encourage everyone to get uh, your FinTech idea protected. If you use the webinar promo code at the checkout process, you can get 20% off our basic patent package. This is a provisional application. You do the drawings, we do the rest. Normally $2,500, now $2,000 for a limited period of time if you put in the webinar promo code in that checkout process. Uh, if you do want something else on the page from our pricing and services, we have strategy packages, we have search packages, we also have other more complex provisional application packages, and we also have DIY packages. You want the 20% off of something else? Email me, let me know. In any case, I strongly urge you to set up a call with me before you decide to buy so we can make certain uh, that this is right for you and to help you pick the right package. Well, that is it. Thank you so much for joining my webinar. Sorry about the technical difficulties of the problem. Uh, uh, and problems at the beginning. Uh, I think we solved them well enough that everyone was able to hear everything. Just judging from the chat coming in, everyone was able to hear it all. So I hope that you will reach out to us with your further questions. Send us an email. Put your email address right now in the chat, but also feel free to drop us a line anytime. Send us an email. Let us know what you're thinking and how we can help you. This is Devorah Grazer from Kiss Patent. Thank you for joining us for our special FinTech webinar and our signing off. Good night.